cluster group seminar, we will just um, do a little introduction of our group if you are new to our presentation. Um, CIHT Kata was formed in January 2012. We are all committee members who are all volunteers um, uh, working towards bringing uh, CPD, organizing regular meetings and seminars to members uh, mainly, and also welcoming non-members to our events. Uh, this, these events all offer excellent opportunity to networking and making contacts with people in the industry, and also a means of for you to gain CPD as well. Um, this is a platform to share best practice, to discuss about topics that um, we are all in the highways and transportation industry. Um, so feel free to contribute to today's seminar. Um, as we are all volunteers and CIHT Gata Group is actually sponsored by 11 companies uh, to facilitate us to organize these seminars. Um, you will see on your screen now the sponsors that we have. Um, next is just to show you that the committee members uh, that are in the CIHT CATA group. Um, at the moment, we have 11 committee members holding different roles uh, within a committee. And we are always looking for um, new people wanting to join us and wanting to contribute towards the committee. So feel free to uh, contact us individually if you know us already, or if not, uh, drop us an email on cihd.kata at gmail.com and we will get back to you. And if you're not um, sure what role you might be doing or you just want to know more about um, the Kata group, uh, feel free to contact us. We can always invite you to a meeting uh, so you, to, you can get to know more about what we do and how we do things. Uh, so about tonight's seminar, um, so welcome to you all. I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, can all participants be on mute, please, because this will really help with the speaker. And also switch off your video, please. Um, uh, I can see one participant here, uh, JM. Uh, can you switch off your video, please? Thank you. Uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the seminar. If you want to ask any question, uh, click on the chat box and send, that, send your uh, questions in. Paul will take those questions and ask our speakers at the end of the session. And this seminar will be recorded. If you want a copy of it, let us know. Uh, we will share that with you. So now um, I will pass the floor to Mel to introduce uh, this evening seminar and our speakers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this evening we'll be speaking, um, we'll be having an event that's called Moving Towards Zero Emissions on, in Public Transport. The growing problem of global warming, envir environmental and air pollution has led many countries to introduce various measures to monitor and action the problem of poor air quality index within their cities. This has left, led to the implementation of various measures in order to reduce and limit vehicle access within built up cities. The requirement for a zero emission public transportation system has become more critical. This evening's presentation will provide us with valuable information on the viability and benefits of introducing a public transport system that is free of emissions. CIHD Cata has the pleasure in welcoming Errol Tan of the Vectio Office UK and Naeem Farouki of WID to enlighten us on their case studies and experience in implementing and managing such systems. Errol's experience ranges from investigating, implementing, and managing sustainable transport solutions on the, on the built that is built on a very strong transport planning background. Naeem has experience of working within trans transit and 
fleet management sectors that has steered him into working with more sustainable vehicle technologies such as natural gas, hydrogen, and electric options. His work has led him to be named as the top 40 under 40 in transport and the clean 50 emerging leader on his approaches to sustainable transportation. Without further delay, I will hand you over to Errol and Naeem. Thank you very much, uh, Mel, for the kind introduction. Uh, Veronica, can I trouble you to switch over to the presentation screen? Lovely, thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Mel and Veronica, for, for the kind introduction, and of course to the CIHT for this opportunity. Uh, needless to say, Naeem and I are absolutely delighted to be able to participate in today's CIHT Qatar meeting. And uh, certainly it's a real pleasure to get to know you, albeit virtually for now, thanks to COVID. Now, the format which uh, Naeem and I will be presenting in will be similar to sort of a roundtable discussion in which one of us will lead, and then the other will jump in to add further detail and then we'll just effectively do a tag team. I'm sure some of you will have questions, but as uh, Veronica was pointing out before, I would ask that you please keep your questions to the end uh, or simply type your questions in the chat so that Paul, uh, as the moderator at the end, can collate those questions for the Q&A round at the end of the, the, the presentation itself. Lastly, uh, we'll be looking to circulate a PDF version of the slides, which will, of course, contain names and my contact details should you wish to get in touch. Okay, so no worries if uh, you don't catch our details in uh, the flyers and various other things that have been circulated beforehand. And without further ado, uh, let's begin. So in terms of today's presentation, the outline uh, is, is as follows. Um, we'll start with uh, a brief introduction. I know that Mel's been kind enough to uh, say a few words about us, but we'll just add a further, uh, some further details and text uh, just to provide you the color as well, uh, as well as our technical background, um, just so that you can understand where we're coming from and how we see certain things. If we get into too much detail, uh, it's because we come from a technical background as transport planners and traffic engineers and specialists in EV. So uh, if you've got any questions, if we've, you're using terminology or jargon that you don't understand, you know, by all means, please uh, put your hand up uh, at the end of the Q&A round. And then moving on, just given the misconceptions about e-mobility, we thought that we would it, that it would be useful for us to go into a, you know briefly describing some of the basic concepts about e-mobility. You know, talking about battery technology, what are the differences, what are the nuances, uh, for instance, compare when you compare, you know, battery electric buses versus internal combustion engines or diesel buses as we know them. And then following that, we will then move on to discuss some of the typical challenges and opportunities surrounding this ecosystem, because there are certainly many. And uh, you'll hear all kinds of misconceptions going out there, which is why we wanted, first of all, to talk about the basic concepts and then to talk about some of the potential challenges as well. And then finally, we'll wrap up with an overview of the current state of the industry and some of the uh, imminent key developments on the horizon uh, in the short term, especially. Uh, and finally, just talking about some of the key lessons learned that uh, Naeem and I have drawn from the global e-mobility project that we've been uh, fortunate enough to, to, to work on. And then finally, of course, uh, as I alluded to before, we will open the floor to the audience to answer any potential questions you might have. So Naeem and I, uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time. We were former colleagues in WSP uh, and Naeem and I have collaborated on numerous e-mobility projects for both international private and public sector clients, including the likes of, you know, for instance, the European Bank for Reconstruction Development. I've personally been fortunate enough to, to work uh, with uh, the MOTC in Doha on the West Bay project, West Bay Autonomous Vehicles project. So, you know, uh, both of us have, you know, like I said before, some 40 years of joint ex international experience, uh, both as public transport and EV specialists, but with slightly different areas of focus. So Naeem, if I could oversimplify, Naeem's really focused on, you know, a lot of the specifications, a lot of the procurement, whereas I'm more the front end in terms of demand forecasting, uh, a lot of the planning, conceptual design, uh, contracting as well. That seems to be an area which I'm getting uh, very, very involved in these days. But I think together as a team, uh, we certainly complement each other. So uh, if you've got any questions, by all means, you know, fire them to us. 
And before I move on to the, the, the following slide, I think suffice to say our experience spans the full project cycle for e-mobility projects from uh, ideation or conceptual design through to procurement, implementation, and monitoring. Uh, Naeem, have you got anything else to add to that? Uh, yeah, Errol, uh, uh, thank you for having me uh, today on this uh, webinar. And I would just add that, you know, as we go through this deck, you'll see why a combination of skill sets are needed to deliver these uh, projects. They're going from very simple, uh, you know, bus vehicle specification operations to very complex systems based approaches to solutions for uh, electrification. So we'll, we'll talk about that today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Dane. So just moving on, as we talked about before, we're just going to jump in really to talk about uh, Electric Mobility 101, uh, basic concepts, uh, just to dispel some of the myths and, uh, sorry, the myths and misconceptions that are out there. So just setting the stage, uh, an internal combustion engine, an ICE or ICE as some people call them, just one of the basic things that you can't get away from is the fact that an internal combustion engine has about 2000 plus moving parts whereas an electric drivetrain and electric engine has less than 30, right? So I think uh, for those of us who are, you know, engineers uh, and scientists, I mean, by, by default, you know, the intrinsic complexities of the two types of uh, engines and drivetrains inevitably leads to a higher chance for breakdowns for IC. And of course, later on, we'll talk about that. But in effect, it translates into lower operating costs and maintenance for uh, electric drivetrains simply because of its intrinsic nature, right? Some of the, the other things that you need to be aware of, uh, energy density in terms of the technology as of today. The energy density of fossil fuels is certainly a lot higher, in so therefore it's in favor of, of, of ICE technology, right? What does that mean? That means that basically if you think about a lithium ion battery for a bus, the battery weight as of today is a lot higher than the weight of, you know, the combined weight of the fuel as well as the tank for a nice vehicle, right? So that's something that we can't get away from as of in terms of the technologies today. But later on, when we talk about some of the evolutions and developments in the technology, we'll come back to this point because there are lots of interesting developments in this aspect. Um, what does that then mean in terms of operations? It also means that in terms of electric vehicles and elect uh, battery electric buses more specifically, it means that the weight limits your driving range and in turn, you know, for some people, you think, uh, you know, for some of you, I'm sure you're electric vehicle drivers or you've thought about buying an electric vehicle. The same anxieties that you have when it comes to deciding to buy an electric car, those are the same concerns that, you know, uh, bus operators have as well when they're trying to decide whether to invest in battery electric buses. You know, it drives the range anxiety for some operators. So that's something to keep in mind. But again, we'll come back to the, some of the evolutions uh, and you know, advancements in the technology that's going to change this whole landscape. And then finally, the most pertinent point when comparing the two is the fact that in terms of engine efficiency, you can't get away from the fact that for a nice uh, internal combustion engine, we're talking about 25 to 30% energy efficiency versus the high 80s to 90% for an electric uh, bus, right? What does that mean? It means that in an uh, internal combustion engine, a diesel engine, the amount of fuel that you're burning, you're only getting 20 something, 30% of that energy tra transformed into kinetic energy, right? The rest of it is dissipated in terms of heat. So, I mean, that, that in itself tells you a lot of things in terms of efficiency, in terms of, you know, some of the benefits in terms of using electric vehicles, setting aside all the other benefits that we'll talk about shortly. So we've talked about the, you know, in terms of the complexities of the engine, of course, that translates into a lower life cycle and OPEC savings uh, for uh, electric mobility as well. But later on, we'll talk about how we can crunch some of those numbers using the tools, using the tools in hand and doing undertaking a proper analysis and uh, ascertaining whether or not there's a business model, a solid business model and business case supporting the introduction of uh, electric buses in your respective systems. Before we get into that, uh, the third point on the slide really is talking about the air quality and noise benefits. Needless to say, 
there's a strong uh, benefit with regards to the use of electric mobility in e-buses, even when you consider the energy production, the carbon footprint of the utility, the uh, electricity grid. That's something that needs to be taken into account. But nevertheless, we've seen lots of studies supporting the idea that even when there is, you know, decarbonize when there is decarbonization of the electricity grid, as that evolves, that's going to make electric mobility even cleaner than it is, uh, leaving aside the clear fact that at the exhaust pipe level, there's nothing com coming out of the exhaust pipe for uh, electric buses. I think one thing to keep, keep in mind is, uh, according to World Resources Institute, Qatar, while not amongst the top 10 in terms of global greenhouse gas emitters, uh, certainly some of the world's, in terms of per capita emissions, you've got some of the world's highest uh, numbers uh, in terms of uh, about 35 tons of equivalent CO2 per person. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I think there are several studies done by the local universities as well that talk about air pollution coming from transport. So I think certainly there is the business case for, for there to be investment in electric vehicles, uh, electric public transport in the country. And uh, we can see some of the initiatives that are being led by MOTC in that direction. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, so let me just make sure that I'm seeing the right thing. So what are some of the key considerations here when thinking about uh, uh, an, uh, an e electric mobility based public transportation system? Well, the first is certainly the key message is to start from first principles meaning start by looking at your operations and demand first, not the technology. I know that uh, oftentimes there is the pressure from um, you know, the executive management and the politicians because uh, electric mobility is very much in fashion right now, you're getting lots of pressure to say, well, let's buy a bunch of electric buses and install the, um, the chargers and away we go. No, I think, uh, Naeem, hopefully you agree with me, but I think the key message here Start from first principles, look at your operations and demand first and not the other way around, not, not be enamored by the technology. Start with first principles. So for example, um, you know, thinking about Qatar, because I wanted to give a few examples uh, that will resonate with, with the audience today. You know, thinking about Route 20, for example, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's a trunk route that connects uh, Mshere bus station to the industrial area. We're talking about a route that's about 20, 21 kilometers long, end to end, uh, and each bus that's being used uh, to deliver the operations right now runs about 300 plus kilometers per day. So, you know, given the nature of the route, the corridor, given the number of kilometers you're running there, given the current technologies, maybe it's not the right type of route for you to think about introducing BEBs, unless you want to introduce, uh, you know, opportunistic charges as well, which we'll come back to. But on the other hand, if you look at Route 79, for example, which connects Al Garafa to the Pearl, you've got fewer vehicle kilometers per day and it's going through more built up areas. So, you know, right off the bat, you think that this is an ideal route for uh, BEB implementation with, of course, opportunistic charging in place. So the next point that we wanted to highlight here was in terms of key considerations is the fact that, um, you know, when you're thinking about walking a path towards lowering emissions for, for transport and, and mobility in general in your cities or jurisdictions, keep in mind, this is not just done using battery electric buses. I mean, you, this can be achieved using a family of different technologies. We know that, you know, for instance, um, there's lots of different technologies out there. Uh, you can see on the screen some of the different technologies that are being used out there these days. These are all proven technologies. We're not, we've not included anything that's, you know, sort of uh, a fringe technology. So you can look at, you know, zero emissions buses comprising battery electric buses, hydrogen fuel cell buses as well. In terms of ultra low emission buses, you've got the hybrids and different types of hybrids within that family. And then of course, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the low emissions buses as well, using you know, biogas and so on. I believe in Qatar, you use bioethanol and you've got CNG buses as well. So that, that's a good interim 
technology to use, uh, but eventually you want to get to a point where there are zero emissions coming out from the, the vehicles. So I think the, the, the key takeaway here is the fact that it doesn't have to be a battery electric bus. It can be one of several types of technologies. So the next point here is the choice of the charging strategy if you do decide to go for a battery electric bus, which of course uh, has zero emissions. It needs to be based, as we said before, I, I'm, hopefully I'm not flogging a dead horse here, but it needs to be based on the operational needs and awareness of different charging standards. Because as of right now, there are lots of different standards being pushed by the different uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs. Uh, but of course, you know, ultimately it needs to be driven by your operational needs. Um, what you see on the slide here is really a very quick summary and overview of the, 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 the two general strategies that uh, a lot of operators do uh, look at. One is overnight charging and the other is opportunistic charging. If I could simplify, overnight charging is when all the buses go back to the depot at the end of the day or the garage. You're just plugging the buses in and you're topping up the energy overnight until they start services again the next day. So typically, you know, these are slow chargers because they are sitting there idle for a much longer period of time. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got opportunistic charging, which means that during the operations, during revenue operations, your buses are running on the routes, but they're getting topped up at specific strategic points along the way, right? So what, what does that mean? It, it means that the chargers that you have in place need to be much higher power than the overnight chargers, right? In terms of kilowatts. Uh, kilowatt, kilo, kilowatts and of course that means that's got all kinds of implications as well in terms of strategically placing those chargers in a location where you can top up the chargers uh, for the buses and later on we'll talk about some of the decision making points that you need to consider when you're trying to decide whether it needs to be an opportunistic charger or it needs to be an overnight charger right but ultimately the key point is make those decisions based on your operations right Naeem, sorry, have you got anything else to add? I think we may have lost Naeem here um, due to technical Naeem difficulties. I think having technical difficulties. I think so too. No, no worries. I'll, I'll continue on and hopefully he'll be able to join us uh, at a later time. Right. Um, I guess the fourth and final point on the slide really is to talk about legacy investment. I know, you know, some of the key questions that are often directed uh, uh, mine and Naeem's way is, you know, the question is, well, we've invested in lots of other technologies. We've bought Euro 6 diesel buses, we've bought CNG buses, we've bought hybrid buses, and now you're telling us we need to buy battery electric buses. You know, can we actually afford these things given that we've already spent all this money doing that? And the answer, the answer is yes, right? The legacy investments such as uh, you know, your, the, the new rolling stock as well as OLE overhead line equipment in the case of trolley buses can certainly be accommodated. And the, the key point is even diesel buses these days can be converted to BEBs. It's not unheard of, it can be done, right? So uh, you know, case in point, um, if we're looking at, um, you know, this is, this is an example of a project that uh, I've worked on previously, I believe it was financed by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, in Gdynia in, in Poland. So they had uh, a legacy system with uh, diesel buses as well as trolley buses for some of the major routes. And they said, well, we want to invest in uh, cleaner technology. How do we do that? And also the other exam question that they had was, okay, we've got some trolley buses. We've spent some money on the OLE. What can we do to actually allow us to give us more flexibility? Because we know that battery electric buses don't depend on wires. They don't depend on OLE, overhead line equipment. And it gives them more operational flexibility, which means that they can actually go off route. They don't need to put up the pantograph to draw energy from the wires, right? So what can we do? So, so in, in this particular situation, we looked at a number of different technologies to incorporate the two. So this is a hybrid of the best sort meaning it's trolley buses, which is electric, plus batteries, which is also electric, right? And you can see some of the different types of battery technologies that they tested, uh, nickel cadmium, lithium ion, LFP, LTO. So different, different implications, different ranges. So I think the key, the key message here is there is, uh, 
if I can use the, the, you know, sort of the layman's terms, I think there is a different technology for different types of needs. And there's certainly the different nuances in these separate technologies as well that will be fit for purpose for your respective operations. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, really, it's, sorry, just... In terms of uh, some of the key success factors that we picked up during the, uh, over the course of the projects that we worked on, so what, what are some of these? Number one, a partnership approach. You know, you, I think the key thing here is really don't plan and implement these systems in isolation. It needs to be done through a partnership approach involving the manufacturers, uh, the local authorities, the utility providers, the transport authorities and operators. In the case of Qatar, of course, that means this means a partnership arrangement between you know, the likes of Moa Salat, Karama, the MOTC and the OEMs, whether it's Scania or VW or MAN or whoever the case may be, or one of the Chinese uh, electric bus manufacturers, work in a partnership because ultimately, uh, when you're thinking about an, an e-mobility system, you're talking about the convergence uh, and an ecosystem that comprises different components. It's not like a traditional diesel bus operation where I've got the buses, I've got the depot, I've got the roads, that's it. I don't have to think about anything else. Okay, some of the ancillary facilities. In the case of uh, e-mobility, there's a lot more involved. Obviously, the energy supply is critical. Um, and later on, you know, with the new uh, introduction of technologies and evolution of technologies such as smart charging and various other things, there are lots of synergies to be realized. So therefore, a partnership needs to be in place. You know, just to expand on that utility uh, piece, uh, I would I would flag that you're dealing with high voltage systems, and most uh, transit operators aren't used to dealing with high voltage systems. So there's a lot of uh, charging equipment and infrastructure exposure there, as well as when you're looking at range extension en route, uh, you're talking about public spaces where you're putting high voltage systems down. So there's also a, a challenge there. Thank you, Naeem. That's actually a uh, perfect segue into what I was going to, the, the, sec the second point I was going to make, because, you know, looking at bus depots, you, you know, the fact that you're dealing with high voltage and you're dealing with uh, the installation of charges on site as well, potentially, if you're looking at overnight charging, this means that the, the depot will need to be retrofitted and you've got new health and safety regulations that you need to keep in mind. So, for instance, again, coming back to Qatar as an example, you know, you've got a, the main bus depot for Moa Salad, I believe, is in Abu Khamor. So, you know, if you were to think about introducing BB operations, of course, you'll start to think about how we can reconfigure the site, how we can install these things. Is there, an, is there sufficient capacity in the utility grid to accommodate, you know, the charging overnight um, and various other things? So there's lots of nuances there. Uh, but again, you know, there is a flip side to this as well. It sounds like, oh, you're asking me to do lots of things to accommodate battery electric buses. But again, you know, if you flip that around, it also represents an opportunity for you to retrofit and correct any previous design flaws in uh, bus depots and garages. In, in my personal experience, hopefully Naeem will agree with me, in my experience, quite often bus depots and garages, um, if they're not through a concession, delivered through a concession, Quite often, it's an architect designing it, uh, the, the bus garage and the depot, and uh, inevitably, they're looking at it from a theoretical point of view. And when the operator comes in, they're not happy, generally happy with you know, some of the design elements, the layout and certain things. So this is an opportunity for you to correct some of those previous design flaws as well. And of course, to introduce any additional future proofing, proofing provisions, uh, just to safeguard uh, you know, scalability of the system and various other things. I just wanted to put this um, slide up. Uh, this is an example of uh, an old depot, a garage in Waterloo in London that was uh, only recently retrofitted to accommodate uh, electric buses. And you can see, you know, like it gives, uh, it gives you a very, very tight layout. Here in the UK, unlike uh, some other countries, we tend to like uh, to bleed our assets, meaning we really, <laughs> 
make use of every single inch of space that we have because, you know, like in London, land is expensive, uh, similar to various, uh, various other countries as well. Um, and certainly we'd like to make the most of every inch uh, uh, on the depot site. So it's all these considerations and you can see also, you know, some of these purple uh, rectangles, that's the installation of new transformers and substations as well, just to be able to accommodate the new uh, e-mobility operations. Just moving on. So there are some other success factors as well. I thought to highlight them, um, and I think the key the key takeaway from this particular slide is the fact that you need to undertake a proper analysis to ensure that there is an economic case and to undertake the feasibility for the electrification study. We're not just going to say that every single case study and situation. BEBs are right, irrespective of your operations. No, that's certainly not the case. You need to undertake the due diligence to make sure that there is a solid business case and there's a solid economic case, starting, of course, with the operations that we talked about before, carrying out pilot projects because lots of the OEMs and bus manufacturers are quite happy to lend you an electric bus to run on your system these days. And you can track the performance of these just to see whether they're in, in line with what the manufacturer is claiming. And of course, you know, with uh, over time, you start to feel more comfortable using these buses as well, because there are all kinds of implications in the sense that, you know, driver behavior and regenerative braking and these sorts of new technologies in the buses will, will come into play. And then finally, the third bullet on the slide here is really do conduct the operation simulations and modeling for actual deployment routes so that you can ascertain, you know, answer some of the key questions like, you know, is, is, there, a, is there a business case? If there is, um, what kinds of routes do we, do we run the electric buses on? And when do we start phasing in these electric buses? So uh, with that, I'd like to maybe just invite Naeem to talk through some of the potential tools that we've, uh, we've used uh, in the past. Naeem, can you walk us through what sort of tools can be used to do these and answer these sorts of exam questions? Uh, sure, uh, can we hit the next slide? So one of the biggest questions people ask about electric buses is range anxiety and how do you actually build a, a, a new block or schedule network around that. So one of the, uh, the things that we've done is we built a simulator that answers the question around range anxiety. So what you can do is you set up three scenarios and you basically play out your network and you can virtually see how that would actually play out in terms of cost as well as range. So here you can see uh, three scenarios where we're testing. Uh, we're looking at scenario two's map on the left and you can see where they put some on-street chargers to extend range and you can see how the vehicle is behaving over the course of the day in terms of the state of charge graph. So OEM manufacturers state that you should keep a minimum safety level of 20%. Some recommend as high as 30%. So so that gives you what, how, how much of the tank you can actually use or the battery capacity. Uh, historically, we've been dealing uh, a lot with the fact that fuel or range on, on internal combustion vehicles aren't really necessary uh, as, a, as a constraint. It's usually been driver operating. And then what you've done is in-service hot seat swap outs. So this is a new, uh, a new challenge. So our blocks or networks aren't designed for it. So the tool like this answers that question and it's powered by uh, you know, some pretty advanced algorithms as well as uh, OEM collaboration around drivetrain. So one of the things I will flag is that the sort test uh, you know, does a simulation on a best case scenario. When you're turning off your HVAC load and you're doing simulations, you're, you're, you're missing 50% of the energy consumption uh, per kilowatt hour over kilometer. So, you know, that's really important using a step like this to validate your, uh, your network's ability to go electric. Uh, next slide. So here you're seeing a transition plan. So this is like a total cost of ownership, CapEx, OpEx scenario. So you're putting the GHG footprint, those are the lines. Uh, and you're seeing all the inputs in terms of capital and OPEX over the over a 50 year, uh, this is actually a 31 year horizon. So you can see how you're transitioning and where you're spending that money. Uh, that big spike in 2043 is actually just purchasing more uh, uh, electric uh, vehicles. 
and it comes with a, a big price tag. Uh, next slide. And this is a, a summary tool that we then we summarize all this information and have scenarios. So a lot of this is uh, driven by policy mandates or uh, organizational objectives. So an organization will come to me and Errol and say, look, we want to be fully electric by 2040, can it be done? So there's a financial cost, there's a practicality of the technology cost, and then there's the detail engineering and design. So those three elements we capture in these sort of scenarios. And it, and we, we layer on resilience. Uh, one of the things is global warming, uh, battery density, you know, battery prices are fluctuating. Uh, Bloomberg reports that, you know, battery prices in the last year have dropped by another. Hi, Naeem, have we lost you? Veronica, sorry, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Uh... Okay. Maybe I'll just jump in here. Um, I think the point that Naeem was trying to make, and we'll come back to this with further detail later on, is the fact that uh, a lot of these um, components, which previously were considered to be weak points for electric mobility and battery electric buses, the, that's changing very rapidly. And even today, for a lot of systems, battery electric buses, in terms of total cost of ownership, is either equal or slightly cheaper than uh, ICE uh, vehicles, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. But with these further developments in terms of evolution of the technology behind the battery electric buses, that's going to tilt more in favor of uh, battery electric buses. So, so certainly, uh, we'll come back to that point again. But effectively, the slide that we were talking about in terms of the NPV cost comparison. So for those uh, of you in the audience who are transport economists, uh, you'll certainly know what we're talking about in terms of trying to quantify these benefits and ensuring that there is an economic and business case supporting uh, the transition to electric mobility. And then finally, this, this last slide was really talking about the facility charging because uh, obviously if you're going to be undertaking uh, a, a situation or introducing a system that's heavily reliant on the idea of uh, undertaking the majority of your charging operations overnight in the depot, then you have to think about you know, the facility charging layout, where the charging lanes are, the type of technology, whether you've got the spare capacity in the grid, uh, the utility grid and so on. Right. But ultimately, I think the point to be made here is ultimately the, the, the tools are here to inform the choices that we make about the appropriate size of the batteries, whether our charging uh, strategy will work. And if, if it's opportunistic charging that we're uh, aiming to undertake, where should these charges go? So going back to the previous slide that Naeem was talking through with uh, the GIS interface, you can actually start to stress test these, these ideas. So if, for instance, since going back to you know, Route 79, which I mentioned before in Doha, if you wanted to introduce battery electric buses on that route, let's stress test that, that route. Uh, we'll put the chargers, we will run the, bat we'll run the electric bus uh, on that route using you know, the GIS coordinates and the, the shape files to say, okay, it's going from here, point A to point B. With a battery, with a, with a, let's say a BYD bus with a battery uh, size of X kilowatt hours, can I actually run those routes with a 20 or 30% safety margin that Naeem talked about? So these are the types of questions and these are the types of simulations and operational analysis that we typically undertake before we recommend a battery electric bus system. So just to close off this section, um, in terms of um, some of the key considerations, and this is uh, at risk of oversimplifying, of course, um, you know, some of the considerations when we think about overnight versus opportunistic charging, there isn't to say that you need to opt for just one and not the other. There are many systems that have some buses charged overnight and they still have opportunistic chargers en route, okay? So that this is not to say it's a binary decision, it's either A or B, no, that's not the case. But, you know, these are some of the general rules of thumb for you to think about when you're thinking about the primary 
um, charging strategy that you want for your system. So on the left side of the slide, you can th you can see you know the length of the bus rounds. You know I talked about the Qatar routes, the Route 79 versus the Route 20. Um, if you're thinking, if your route generally tends to be very very short. Um, like school bus routes, for example, then you can start to think, well, you know, I don't really need to have opportunistic charging because the batteries these days are large enough for me to run, you know, the, all the routes I need to run, right? So there isn't uh, much of a need for opportunistic charging. So you can see in, in the first row, length of bus rounds. So the shorter the routes, it tends to favor overnight charging. In terms of layover time, if uh, your operating plan, for instance, has a lot of layover time uh, built into it, so for instance, you tend to give five to eight minutes for your drivers at the end of each route for them to you know, use the toilets, use the ablution facilities to have a smoke or whatever the case may be, that's a, an opportunity for you to think about actually topping up the charges for the buses as well, right? So therefore, if you've got more layover time, uh, at the end of the route, then you might want to think more about opportunistic charging simply because it gives you the time to be able to top up the energy for, for those buses. Um, if your traffic delays are severe in the city where it's very variable, you know, like if it floods, like for instance, we worked in some countries and cities in sub-Saharan Africa, right? So in some cases like Kampala, Uganda, where, you know, if it, if it rains, there's so much rain that basically half the network's not usable anymore, you know, like, so traffic jams are severe, can be super severe. So in those, those situations, you might want to think about favoring overnight charging rather than opportunistic charging because you might not have enough time to top up the charges, right, in terms of trying to play catch up all the time. So, so these are some of the considerations um, that you need to think about from an operational perspective. And then the last two, uh, the second to last one is about the grid connection capacity. We talked about that before. If your depot, your garage has, you know, in terms of the utility connections, ele ele the electricity grid uh, connections into the site, there isn't much spa spare capacity for you to introduce, you know, massive, numbers of chargers overnight, then you might want to think about opportunistic charging, right? Simple as that. And then finally, of course, the depot bus capacity. If you're having to move your buses around all night and plug them all in and put them in a, a, a concrete deck where all of them need to be charged and have access to chargers, then if you've got space constraints, then opportunistic charging is probably the way to go, right? So these are some of the key considerations. I'm not saying that these are hard and fast rules, but certainly some of the things that you want to think about from an operational perspective. So where are we in terms of the state of industry uh, as of today? Well, um, I think many of you are probably aware of the fact that the majority of the electric mobility, and I'm talking about battery electric buses more specifically, 98% uh, are operational in China. Uh, one percent is in Europe, and the rest of the four hundred thousand plus electric buses circulating throughout the world is in the rest of the world, right? So, so we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg, uh, but uh, that's going to accelerate. It's probably going to grow exponentially. Um, you know, for instance, lots of uh, countries in the EU are looking to fully electrify their fleet in the next ten years. I'll give you some examples of the cities uh, near to where I am. I'm based in the UK. You know, Oslo, for example, uh, capital of Norway is looking to fully electrify their fleet of uh, 1,200 buses by 2028. Uh, Copenhagen is trying to do 575 of all, all of their buses by 2025. Berlin and Hamburg, about 1,000, 1,300 buses by 2030. Uh, in London, for, in for instance, you know, closer to home, 2037, we're hoping to have nearly 10,000 electric buses, right, which is all of London's fleet. So, so there's lots going on. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot going on, and it's looking very positive in terms of electric mobility rollout in all, all the major countries in the next 10 plus years. Um, Coming back uh, closer to home, of course, uh, BEB projects have started in the Middle East. Uh, Khalifat and Simmons have a JV um, launching BEBs uh, in the UAE. They launched, uh, I think, the first pilot route in 2019. And of course, uh, in Qatar, um, I'm sure Veronica can speak more about this, but uh, I know that there are plans to have 25% uh, of the Mosalat's fleet electrified by 2022 alongside, you know, uh, electric uh, robo-taxis, electric taxis, and so 
on as well. So it's really interesting times and there's lots happening here. So what's on the horizon? Um, you remember we discussed some of the shortcomings of BEBs such as you know, lower energy density, potential range anxiety. Well, I, we believe that there are a number of major developments on the horizon which will increasingly favor BEBs, right? Some of these are listed on the, on, on the slide here. The first is, of course, newer battery chemistries with higher energy density. Um, we're talking about you know, things like NMCA, nickel, manganese, cobalt, aluminum oxide. There is uh, uh, an increasing use of NMST batteries as well. Um, I'm not gonna get too technical here, but you know, there's all kinds of exciting things happening in terms of battery chemistries. Uh, there's solid state batteries as well. There's the um, uh, further onset and introduction of uh, fuel cell uh, EVs as well. So there's all kinds of technologies evolving very rapidly. Um, and that's only, if anything else, it's just going to further favor uh, electric mobility. Um, Naeem talked about the second bullet, rapidly declining prices of batteries. You can see actually on the, on the figure on the left side of the slide, the battery pack prices in real terms since uh, in 2018 prices, this is coming from Bloomberg. Just look at the, the quantum of change going from year to year. We're talking about years here, right? 2010 to 2018, massive changes. You were talking about most of the time double digit uh, declining prices for batteries. So they're expecting um, to hit under 94 US dollars per kilowatt hour by 2024 and 62 kilowatt hours by 2030. What does that mean? It means much cheaper batteries. It means much more energy dense batteries. And what does that mean? Of course, in the overall scheme of things, it means that you're gonna have much cheaper battery electric buses. Why? Because as of right now, I mean, 40 to 50% of the cost of a bus is in the battery itself, right? So, and with uh, the anxieties and concerns that people have generally when thinking about electric mobility, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing that you need to pick off. Um, some further points, what's on the horizon? Of course, we know that Qatar has its National Vision 2030 and I believe Pillar 4 is looking to um, decarbonize the grid. So there's lots of interesting things happening here. Um, you know far more than me, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail. And there are some of the peripheral um, evolutions and advancements as well. Like for instance, uh, smart charging, which can help attenuate energy demand peaks. Um, and of course, more importantly, the industry mindset. Everyone talks about electric mobility, like it, it, it's a bit of a no brainer these days. But if you go back five to 10 years, it certainly wasn't the case. Right. So there's lots of interesting things happening in this regard. So just to, to summarize, I wanted to maybe just pick off very quickly some of the key takeaways. And again, uh, just to, to point out the fact that we will be sharing the slides so you don't have to take notes. Um, we're happy to share these in PDF format so that you can, you can really um, think about these. And if you've got questions, again, happy to take those. But really some of the key takeaways that you see on the screen, the decision to transition to zero emissions needs to start from your operational considerations and not be a tech driven question, right? We've, uh, you know, keep banging on this drum, but it needs to start there, start from first principles and not jump into it uh, without understanding the implications and the need for it. Second point, e-mobility can be phased in and designed to be compatible with your legacy systems. You know, I talked about Qatar, I talked about uh, Poland before. Um, Qatar, I think your buses are fairly new, correct me if I'm wrong, Veronica, but you know, like the average age of your buses are probably three and a half to four and a half years, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, you think, well, we've spent all this money on these uh, diesel and CNG buses. Do we really need to invest in e-mobility? I think to some degree, you've already answered that question because I can see the initiatives to uh, electrify 25% of the fleet. So that's great. But again, you know, just to stress the point that these can be compatible with legacy systems. Uh, you know, these sunk costs that you've invested in these other systems, they've not gone to waste, okay? Um, the third bullet here is really developing the business case and undertaking the due diligence and analysis to provide the evidence for viability. Work, with partnership, work in partnership with OEMs, utility companies and operators, because together you can then start to compare notes. You can then just look at things from the, the side of the grid as well, because oftentimes as transport planners and traffic engineers, we don't think about the side of the energy side of things, uh, or at least I don't. 
um, I'm sure some of you do, but you know, for me, when I first started uh, on the e-mobility path, certainly I didn't think about these things, but when working with, in partnership with the OEMs and utility companies, you can start to see how things shift. And because this is such a, 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 an ecosystem that's growing exponentially and changing exponentially, certainly you want to, to, to look at those things and work in partnership. Uh, and then finally, the last two bullets, uh, don't just think about the direct benefits in the form of you know, OPEC savings um, and uh, environmental benefits. Of course, the total cost of ownership needs to be calculated because of the evidence base and establishing the business case for it. But you know, with all the advancements that we've talked about, especially those on the, the, the near-term horizon in terms of the cheapening of uh, lithium-ion batteries and various other things and the various technologies that go into uh, e-mobility systems, you know, increasingly in time, it's going to be tilt further in favor of uh, battery electric buses in our view. And then, of course, not forgetting secondary benefits as well. There is, these days, uh, lots of people talk about the circular economy. There is a second life of batteries. I haven't talked too much about this point, but certainly um, there are lots of benefits uh, because at the end of the useful life of batteries, they can be repurposed for other things as well. What is the relevance to Qatar then? Uh, I think I've alluded to this uh, throughout the presentation, but again, just to summarize, e-mobility obviously offers a pathway to reduce transport related emissions. Uh, I think it's, it's fairly clear, um, but let's not forget as well, it's not just the environmental benefits. Uh, there's all kinds of other opportunities as well in terms of the supply chain. Uh, talk, you know, we can think about the upskilling of the workforce in secondary or tertiary industries such as the production of lithium ion batteries, you know, and even within the OEM themselves, right? So for example, recently, uh, Gozan signed uh, uh, a JV with uh, Alatia Motors in, in Qatar, I believe. So, you know, these are various opportunities and Gozan, of course, is, is using a lot of EV technology. So there's all kinds of opportunities within the, the supply chain as well. Um, also, other new deriv derivative industries can be expected, such as uh, you know battery recycling, for example, because eventually all these lithium-ion batteries uh, and in all these electric vehicles will need to be recycled, and you know certainly there'll be industry picking up uh, that that uh, strand as well. Um, and with that, uh, I guess. You know, we've come to the end of our presentation. I'd like to give the floor back to, I believe Paul is the moderator for the Q&A. And I'd like just to, to open the floor to, to questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Earl. Very interesting stuff there. Um, I've no doubt this technology will be uh, widespread in the future. Um, plenty of questions for you here. <laughs> uh, I'll start off. What about the life expectancy of these batteries and asset management? Great question. Uh, Daryl, do you want... Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, apologies. My internet has been uh, very unreliable during this entire webinar. Uh, so in terms of battery life cycle, it, it goes back to the degradation of the battery. And there's two ways the batteries degrade. So one is the cell chemistry itself and then the resistance within the, within the battery pack. And both are impacted the way you charge. So if you do fast charging on street, uh, you tend to uh, accelerate the degradation. You can see two to 4% uh, per annum. If you do slow charging, it's about one to one and a half percent. So you'll see a lot of uh, operators will actually use slow charging, uh, primarily as their uh, means of charging the battery versus, the, versus on street being just used as a top up for range extension. Uh, depending on your bus life cycle, uh, you, you would be planning uh, a midlife battery pack uh, upgrade. So we recommend in North America, we keep buses 12, 15 or 18 years. Uh, we recommend at year eight or nine. Sounds like we've lost Naeem again. Um, yes. Again. Yeah, so I think uh, just to finish off Naeem's sentence, uh, I think we're looking at about, in North America at least, uh, it's eight or nine. I believe in the Middle East and some of the Asian cities, we tend to replace our buses a lot sooner than that. We look at usually 10 to 12 years as a useful life of the bus. And therefore, you know, correspondingly, you would probably swap your batteries, um, you know, about uh, two thirds way through that or half through that, depending on your, again, back to your, um, how many vehicle kilometers you're running. But, you know, 
coming back to the point about the evolution of the bus, uh, the lithium ion battery technology, there is so much going on in this space that eventually within the next three, four or five years, we ex we're expecting to see not just newer technology batteries, but longer life batteries as well. So, you know, the stuff that we're seeing is only pertinent to the technology right now. So battery swap might be become a thing of the past you know uh, many of you have probably seen the likes of tesla talking about the million mile batteries and things like that so uh, tesla is of course you know sort of the leader in terms of uh, battery management systems and their battery technology but a lot of that will be trickling down as well to um, heavy bus uh, heavy vehicle manufacturers such as bus manufacturers Harold, did, uh, did did you hear the degradation by the charging speeds yeah, we had. Oh, uh, yes, oh, yes, okay. we did. Yep. Sorry, yeah, this is very unreliable. The other point I would flag is the traction motor itself. It has about uh, 82,000 cycles in it as well. So the traction motor is another item that you would have to do in the overhaul. Okay. Uh, following on to that question, um, do we know how these batteries will cope in the Middle East? As you know, we've got extremely hot summers here, it can reach 50 degrees or sandstorms, stuff like that, specific environmental factors to the Middle East. Yeah. Do you, do you want to start and then I can, I can jump in as well, Naeem? Sure. Uh, so the battery packs are uh, enco enco encompassed in a, in, a, in a package that has been tested for various extreme temperatures. Uh, so uh, I think sand and other things going in that have been uh, looked at in terms of design. Uh, I think the issue with the heat becomes how much of the energy is needed to keep the the battery cells at their operating range so extreme heat or extreme cold has uh, challenges on the cold spectrum we do see dendrite formation occur so that's one of the the challenges so you have to constantly shore power uh, via, uh, vehicles uh, to make sure that you're not losing battery capacity uh, then what the the bigger issue becomes is the HVACs to, to cool that bus. So we did simulations in Los Angeles and we did 120 Fahrenheit, uh, an extreme 10 year out case. And we found that the, uh, the vehicles were consuming something like uh, four and a half kilowatts per kilometer driven. So the extreme heat or extreme cold has a huge impact. And that's why you're seeing uh, uh, auxiliary heaters being powered by diesel uh, in cold climates. And for hot climates, they are looking at other ways to cool the vehicle. Yeah, just, just to add to that, uh, and Veronica will know this very well, you know, in terms of dealings with uh, the likes of Gozan, there's lots of new battery technologies as well. So, you know, lithium polymer batteries and various other things. And some of these are starting to show lots of promise in terms of operations and very, very high temperatures as well. So, you know, just picking up what Naeem's talked about, um, typically when we're talking about, you know, comfortable temperature ranges, uh, you're talking about for a 12 meter standard uh, length bus, you're talking about roughly, right, rule of thumb, uh, about one kilowatt hour per bus kilometer. But then, you know, that goes, can go up to 15, 20% uh, as you your temperatures rise because of uh, all the parasitic load, turning on the air conditioning, turning on the heating and various other things. Okay. Um, what about electricity consumption for all these electric buses? Uh, it, it varies again, depending on what you're, uh, how you're operating it. So the network itself. So that's why the Zeus simulator and, and range simulators are very important because topography, passenger weight, HVAC are big variables that impact the consumption per kilowatt driven. So that that's one uh, big element that uh, you know. It... Yep. So so just to add to that as well, I think I just uh, kind of uh, my answer preceded the the last question, Paul, uh, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of the actual rolling stock itself. Not talking about powering buildings and stuff. In terms of the bus kilometers itself, we're kilometer. looking for. A... Yeah, per kilo uh, kilometer uh, kilowatt energy is uh, seven seven kilowatts per kilometer driven. And that's due to the fact that the vehicles idle and move on a very slow speed in the Manhattan duty cycle. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what financial challenges have cities encountered where electric buses have been introduced? Do you want to take this question first, Naeem, and then I'll jump in as well? 
Sure. Uh, so one of the challenges is the utility itself. So the utilities are very keen to see electrification play out, but they don't want to, some cases don't want to spend the money. So we've seen cases in North America where utilities will use a peak demand pricing uh, as, a, as, as a deterrent or delivery charges. So having that utility conversation early on is very important and mapping out where on the network you're actually asking for the electricity. So, uh, you know, th that's one of the first things that I would, I would tell someone is to have that conversation with the utility because if it's not at the time of day they like or the location, you could be talking massive infrastructure upgrades. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. Um, what about the disposal of all these batteries? Do you see this as being environmentally friendly? So there, there's two, two points there. One is that you can reuse these batteries. So as the batteries fail and they have you know, less than 30, uh, they've lost 30% of their density capacity, you can move them to on-site storage. And that's sort of the transition a lot of... Uh, operators and electric vehicle uh, you know fleets are looking at the second is actually recycling the content inside so the recycling price points are not competitive and they require government subsidies so like the European Union the USA have have created uh, subsidy programs uh, California has right now the largest EV recycling facilities in the world so it's three three facilities where they're stripping down uh, the uh, batteries back to their original components and uh, materials and, uh, and basically selling them back into the market. Okay. And can all of the battery parts be recycled? Uh, a good chunk of it can be. Okay. Sorry, just to, just to add to that as well, Paul, uh, it depends on the battery chemistry as well. So, you know, some of the, because obviously the different battery chemistries have different amounts of, you know, some of the more precious metals in there. So for instance, an LFP battery, lithium uh, iron phosphate battery versus an NMC battery, which these are the two most common battery chemistries. The NMC will get you a lot more money. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen, I've seen the recycling numbers come back. Uh, recycling the materials will get you, you know, three to 4,000 US dollars in terms of the raw materials extracted from it. Whereas an LFP is probably about a 10th of that. So there are economies of scale, but it also depends on the battery, battery chemistry as well. And how long they last, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, but again, you know, this comes back to the fact that a lot of the batteries are improving exponentially. We're not talking about decades. We're talking about year on year improvements, right? So you can start to see some of these um, improving very, very rapidly uh, further in favor of uh, BBs. Okay. Um, which country is the most advanced in electric bus implementation? I think you might have answered that. Is it China? Yeah, in terms of sheer numbers, uh, I don't know whether you agree with me, Naeem, but, but because there are so many manufacturers who are getting into this uh, space, China certainly has been the leader in terms of pure numbers, and they're very, very good in terms of what they do. So, you know, the likes of BYD and Yutong and various other bus manufacturers, but a lot of the um, North American and European manufacturers, I believe, have caught up um, in the sense that, you know, like you can see Man, Solaris, Irizar in Spain, you, you've, uh, you've got Proterra in North America. So a lot of these are are designing not just really good buses, but also the battery technology that goes, uh, you know, hand in hand with that, that technology as well. And in many cases, the production of the batteries uh, and the carbon footprint resulting from the production of the batteries also plays a key role. And in the likes, in the case of uh, European and American OEMs, we find that uh, the carbon footprint for the battery production tends to be lower than the Chinese manufacturers. Okay, so are most of the manufacturers in China then at the moment? No, I th I, I, in terms of uh, sales, uh, certainly the Chinese manufacturers still lead the way. Uh, so for instance, you look at Shenzhen, right? In 2016, I think they electrified their entire municipal fleet, 16,000 electric buses by tw in 2016, right? Okay. 16,000 electric buses is more than basically all the world, the rest of the world's electric buses combined just to give you a sense of scale yeah yeah so that's where that statistic came from 99%. yeah exactly and that's that's just one city in china right that's shenzhen so okay 
Um, do you have any trials in similar Gulf countries to Qatar on how have the systems coped? Yeah, I think uh, we mentioned the UAE. UAE. Yeah, Yeah, I believe uh, Oman is kicking up a few. They're undertaking a few pilot projects as well, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, uh, everyone knows Qatar is, uh, you know, one of the leaders in terms of uh, pushing the envelope for e-mobility. Any idea of the results yet for the one in the UAE? Uh, I don't, I, I haven't seen the results myself. So uh, certainly we can reach out to, you know, our friends in Siemens to see what's going on there. Um, I don't know if you know anything about this, uh, Naeem? Uh, I didn't catch that. Which city was it? Uh, in the UAE. And we know that there is a, a battery electric bus project, a JV between uh, Siemens and one of the local companies. Yeah, I think there there was an expo where they actually have a, a UE built uh, electric bus. I did see an article about that, but uh, I don't know anything more than that this time. Okay, fair enough. Um, can you elaborate about hydrogen buses? Are these the future? Yeah, so one of the things that we didn't speak about is scalability. When you scale up a battery electric uh, yard or garage or depot, uh, you tend to face a lot of infrastructure restraints in terms of physical space and upgrades from the utility, uh, whereas hydrogen has an inverted cost curve. So once you go past uh, 50 buses and especially 150 buses at one location, hydrogen becomes a much more economical source to achieve zero emission. So it, it, I, I call this the HD DVD Blu-ray battle. It's still being fought and there's different geographies that have invested differently. If you look in the uh, in Asia, in Japan uh, and Korea, they're heavily invested in hydrogen as their solution. Uh, and Europe is uh, you know, heavily invested in battery electric and they're also making advancements in hydrogen at the same time. So it's still unknown because we haven't seen that level of scale yet play out in outside of China. So is there a massive difference in the infrastructure needed for battery and hydrogen? Yeah, so hydrogen is hydrogen is a natural evolution from natural gas. Uh, it's at a 5,000 psi level, so natural gas is done at 37, uh, 3,600 psi. So uh, hydrogen is just, it's a fueling station, like a traditional gas station, and you connect in and you use it, and you can create green hydrogen or blue hydrogen, and that impacts the upstream emissions footprint of the hydrogen that you're putting into the vehicle with fuel cells. Okay. Um, one last question. Uh, how big are these batteries compared to an auto car battery? So, so the cells are similar. It's the packaging of the cells. So you see like a Tesla is a hundred kilowatt, the Tesla Model S. Uh, mm-hmm. a, a bus battery is like can be 300, 400 kilowatt packages. It's the, uh, the cells are very similar, but the way you package them and you create the modules is much bigger because you have a bigger surface on a bus to store yeah, store right these back. Okay, that's all the questions. I uh, won't keep you guys any longer. Um, Ryan, do you want to close it out? Oh, thank you, Paul. Um, so thank you, Aru and Naeem, for this seminar on a up and coming topic and certainly very relevant to Qatar. Uh, apologies, Naeem, for some of the technical difficulties that you faced. Um, but, but we are honored to have you both joining us today and giving us uh, your expert opinion on this topic. Uh, to all our participants here, I hope all of you have um, enjoyed this webinar and find this useful. Uh, if you have any suggestion on future seminar topics or any feedback on this uh, current seminar, or even if any of you are thinking of joining the committee, please get in touch with us. Uh, We are on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, and can be rich on email, uh, which is the email that you receive um, our invitation from. That's cicht.kathar at gmail.com. So without keeping any of you any longer, so thank you all, and uh, looking forward to having you at our next seminar at the end of November. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Veronica, and uh, the CIHT team for uh, for having us today. It was a real pleasure. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.